right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It's uh, 3 o'clock here Eastern Time, and I think we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, webinar for today. Uh, this is Stephanie Hall, and I am with the ESRD NCC National Coordinating Center. Thank you for joining us today for our professional COVID-19 educational webinar event. Uh, as you know, these events are being held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The series of events feature guest speakers from around the country sharing how they or their organizations they are, are with are coping with COVID-19. Before we get started, I do want to let everybody know this call is being recorded and will be posted to the NCC COVID webpage within about three business days. Matt, next slide. So we talked a little bit about what the call is about. Uh, today, we actually have two speakers with us. We have Dr. Provavera, he's the physician lead with Kaiser Permanente, and we also have Dr. Zing, senior partner with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, their topic today, they're gonna be talking about the Kaiser Permanente North California Home Dialysis Program. And um, every, uh, all the participants have been on mute uh, upon entry into this webinar, but we do want to hear from you. If you do have questions uh, during the presentation or at the end, we ask that you please submit them during, uh, in the, into the Q&A or via the um, chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Next slide. So if you've been on uh, one of our professional webinar events, you know we do them twice a month. Uh, they're on different topics and they usually have, we hear from different stakeholders and peers in the ESRD community who are adopting to COVID-19. Uh, they share examples and provide some real world strategies for facilities to use during this pandemic. Next slide. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Dr. Provavera. He graduated from Russia State U Medical University and completed training in internal medicine and nephrology in Brookdale University Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He joined Kaiser in 2004 as Chief of Nephrology for the Central Valley in California. Currently, Dr. Provavera serves as a nephrology chief in Oakland, as well as medical director for ESRD contracted services for Kaiser Northern California and as a physician lead for Kaiser National Renal Care Services. We also have with us Dr. Zing. He is a staff nephrology and nephrologist and senior partner for the Permanente Medical Group and Kaiser Permanente since 2008. He is a strong advocate for home dialysis therapy. He is the medical director of Wellbound, Emeryville, their home dialysis clinic. Dr. Zing is also the chair of the Northern California National Kidney Foundation Annual Scientific Symposium, which brings together nephrologists, nurses, dietitians, and social workers from around the country to discuss the latest information on patient care. So welcome, and um, who's Dr. Zing, are you starting us off? Correct. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, uh... Thanks, NCC, invite us to give this important talk. So what, next slide, please. So this is our objective. Um, we have this home dialysis first approach and uh, that every patient we ask, why not home? Then we also have this multidiscipline approach and you are going to see in the cases that we work together with our radiologists, with our surgeons, our renal case managers, social workers uh, to help our patient get to home. And uh, not only that, we find out that when patients after training, when they get home, they also need continued support. And the last, we're going to talk about telehealth uh, during the pandemic and uh, Maximum's video visit. Next slide, please. So agenda, so I'm going to talk about three patient uh, stories, the real, real cases, real stories. And then Dr. Leo Pavavera is going to go from the higher level of uh, how the organization approach uh, home first uh, approach. Next slide, please. All right, case number one, uh, return to dialysis. We have this 70-year-old uh, man who has uh, that was on dialysis due to lupus nephritis, and uh, he has a left upper arm fistula. 
Good thing is he received a living unrelated kidney transplant about five years ago. However, uh, over the past five years, he's been moving back and forth between two cities uh, of Northern California live with family members. So then he changed his uh, nephrology care between Kaiser Permanente and the VA. As you know, unfortunately, during the process of those fragment of care, and he has not been uh, follow up as well as it's supposed to be. And then he showed up in the emergency room uh, with acute kidney injury. And obviously the big thing is rejection. They did a biopsy, they found acute rejection, but also have very severe chronic changes already. Next slide, please. So he was treated with very high dose steroid and other immunosuppression, was hoping that his, we can bring his transplant graft back. Unfortunately, about two weeks later, he returned to the transplant center and they have to start him on dialysis. And makes things even worse, his previous fistula is not working, and so they have to uh, place a femoral dialysis catheter. Um, and I'm sure this scenario has been quite familiar with many of the audience in the room. Uh, you, we all see patients like that. Um, so the first thing we want to do is make sure that we can have a better access for him instead of femoral access. So his case was presented at our monthly multidisciplinary conference. And for those of you who don't have this type of uh, conference, I strongly encourage you to uh, work with your vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, nephrologists, social workers, and renal case managers. We uh, meet about once a month. Uh, we, before the pandemic, we meet in person. We buy lunch for everybody from our department budget. And uh, after the pandemic, we switched this to uh, virtual. And it's a very good practice uh, that builds a commonality, collegiality between all the specialists. And we go over every, most of the patient we have challenged with that vascular access. And later we add a general surgeon into this uh, group to discuss PD catheter. Uh, if there's any issues with PD catheter, we discuss in this meeting. So this is a good practice I strongly encourage if you don't have that in your practice yet. So when we review his venogram performed outside hospital and the whole team realized he actually had really no uh, other dialysis access except that uh, femoral catheter. So the conclusion at that time was um, he has exhaustive vascular access for fistula graft. So the, definitely the next choice is peritoneal dialysis for him. Next slide, please. So let me ask you, pause here, ask what are you going to do uh, in a situation like this? Uh, femoral catheter, venous catheter for life. Uh, most people were sent to the in-center hemodialysis, and hopefully uh, he can be trained for home hemodialysis if the catheter is the only choice he has. Obviously, you want to relist him for transplant, and hopefully uh, that he can get a transplant soon with a living donor. And next is hope his transplant graft maybe can return some function and he can be off the hemodialysis temporarily. Uh, it's probably unlikely. Uh, the next option is peritoneal dialysis. So this is our goal. At that moment, my plan is talk to him into either PD or home hemo. Next slide, please. So I talked to him about uh, peritoneal dialysis. He's not interested. He said, well, you know, I don't think I can take care of myself. Um, then I talked to him this program called Optimal Transitional Program, uh, which is another name uh, in literature called TCU. It's called Transitional Care Units, which is a unit within an in-center hemodialysis unit that you educate the new dialysis patient about home therapy. Uh, as soon as he heard about that, he said, no, I'm not interested in home dialysis. Um, then I talked to him. I sat down with him. I said, now, you know, this we call it a different name called Optimal Transitional Program because our, this program is set up at a uh, satellite uh, home hemo, uh, dialysis, in-center dialysis uh, center. What it does is not only teach patients about home therapy, but also educate patients about adherence to diet, salt, 
medication, discuss transplant, discuss other issues. I think most patients go through that program when even when they decide not to choose home dialysis, they actually do better uh, when they stay the in-center dialysis because they understand the full restriction, salt restriction. So he gradually, reluctantly agreed. Um, the key at this point is when the person is hesitating, wavering, you need to show your support. You need to constantly contact with the patient to answer their question. So he was discharged home from the hospital to the in-center hemodialysis clinic uh, going through the optimal transitional program. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a perspective we uh, published a couple years ago uh, with Dr. Bob Rockledge from University of Virginia and also Dr. Bowman about the transitional care program. I think, uh, think about a transitional care program is additional support to patients when they newly start to in-center hemodialysis. Many of them don't know what dialysis is about. You know, especially for paratroop patients. So this is a process, a unit within an in-center hemodialysis clinic, help patient to understand what dialysis is about. Um, I think this is, my personal view is every in-center hemodialysis clinic should have one of this unit. Uh, next slide, please. So back to this patient. So. Miraculously, after four weeks of the optimal transitional program at the incentive unit, our nurse has done a wonderful, wonderful job. He decided, I'm going to give peritoneal dialysis a trial. However, uh, for those of you who have been in Northern California knows uh, housing in Northern California is very scarce, rent is high, and most people live in a very small space. Uh, he doesn't think he have enough space to supply his uh, PD supplies. So at that time, our decision is continue him on in-center hemo until he get a larger uh, apartment. But in that process, we need to continue discuss the PD with patient. So every visit with him, I discuss PD and continue show support and he's continued to have interest on doing PD. And finally, he get a big apartment a few months later uh, then a PD catheter was placed by the general surgeon and he started PD training. Uh, next slide, please. Then another challenge we faced with him is he kind of has a little bit poor memory. Sometimes he forgot. So the PD clinic nurse, very creative, used many tricks to teach him how to use it. And finally, they told me they think he can go home to do PD. Um, you know, for a patient going from in-center training for PD, going back home to do PD, that's a big transition. Uh, the analogy I always thought about is, um, you know, my son just got his driver's license. Um, I, I always worry about he would drive by himself on the highway. So I think for somebody just get a driver's license, you need more support, a little bit of support, letting him gradually uh, able to drive by himself independently. This is almost like our patient who get trained in the in-center uh, for PD. Uh, when they get home, preferably we have somebody there to see what's going on at home. So luckily we have this new uh, pilot program called Assist PD program, uh, which is modeled by some other country, as, and some of the clinic in the United States also is doing it, is having a nurse or somebody go to patient's home to watch how they do at home. Uh, this is, I put the reference here, you can uh, get that uh, article if you're interested in reading that. Next slide, please. And so this is the final uh, summary of this patient that he uh, has failed transplant. The transitional care program, or we call it optimal transitional program, and choosing PD, continuous support when he's in center, and use the assist PD program when patients get trained in the PD center and uh, when they get home. So this is. Uh, uh, right now, he's doing very well, fully independent, uh, doing PD. Uh, next case, please. So the second case is an uh, incident patient who does not want to start dialysis. I'm sure this is very familiar with you too. 
a 60-year-old male who with poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension. When he come to see me, his EGFR is about 15. And uh, he, at that time, does not believe he has CKD. Okay, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a uh, patient like that. And so what we did is we have multiple visits with me and our renal case manager, our dialysis clinic. And we utilize all kinds of visits, face-to-face, telephone visit, emails, video visit. As soon as his question, we try to get answer his question as soon as possible. So his kidney function gradually declined to each year for about 8 ml. Uh, he presented with symptoms, nausea, vomiting, and, and more recently, his my electrolyte disturbance. His bicarb is about 16, 15. His potassium is tearing up like between like 5.8, uh, a couple of times going up to 6. Um, I, I give him KSLA, a later change to permit um, he still doesn't want to start dialysis. Okay. Um, next slide, please. So what are you going to do? You start him on dialysis with a catheter? You start with a dialysis with a catheter? Or you start him on dialysis with a catheter? I think 80% of people start a dialysis with a catheter. I think most of the time people will do that. Or the next is urgent PD start. Uh, next slide, please. So that's what we did. Um, he still does not want to stop dialysis at that time. So we continue to let him visit in center hemo and the PD clinic. He just does not like in center hemo. And at that time, that's the height of the COVID. He's like, I'm not going to that place to get COVID, which I totally agree with him. I said, let's do PD. And uh, so we continue to support him during this period with virtual visit, telephone visit, video visit, emails, um, pretty much on demand. When he wants to talk to me, I ask my assistant book with him within a day or two. Uh, because the beauty of telehealth that we could set up seeing the patient as quick as they want. And at, during that process, they feel they are supported by you, they trust you, then they will follow your recommendation. And he was managed with bicarbonate and potassium binders, low protein dye, and laxative. And his each year for graduate declined to like 5 ml per minute. Uh, finally, he agreed to start PD. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings the question is, when is the ideal timing for dialysis initiation? Uh, I, for those of you who was uh, trained recently, you all know this quote, early start, unquote, uh, concept back maybe a decade ago about we should start patient optimally when they each of about 15, uh, so they don't have bad outcome afterwards. The ideal study, uh, initial dialysis early and late study, uh, published, I think, 2002 or 2004, I forgot, or two, two, no, I'm sorry, maybe 2008 or 2009, um, has disputed this concept. They compare with people start dialysis with each of 10 versus 15, find there's actually no difference in outcome, but people start with each of around 10, can start dialysis about six months later. And various registry shows in different country or different jurisdictions, uh, the initiation of dialysis is very different. In Taiwan is five, average uh, is five, in United Kingdom is about 8.5, and the U.S. is about 11. Uh, if you look at the recommendation from Japanese Society of Nephrology, they were actually saying you, the language they use is do not delay until the each year from about two. Okay, so my interpretation to me is you can start people if they are three or four, as long as they don't have electrolyte disturbance, as long as they are relative feels okay. Um, and I think this in the COVID time when the resource is very scarce and then when a patient like him does not want to start dialysis, the last thing you want is heavy handedly push him into in center hemodialysis with a catheter. Um, you need to work with the patient, building the trust, uh, using all conservative management to delay initiating dialysis as much as possible. Um, next slide, please. 
So if you forget everything I said, I think this is the most important slides uh, I'm going to talk about is the four habit of communication. That's the key of patient care, uh, building a relationship, building a trust between patient and you. Uh, the old turn of compliance and later change to adherence. I think we should go a little bit further than adherence. We should find a way to activate patients. And this is how we do it. You need to build a trust. You Every visit you invest in the beginning, ask what they want and listen to them and elicit their perspective. Our department, uh, every year, we set up a site uh, three or four half days without seeing patients, all of us, nephrologists, renal case managers, social workers, front desk MA, we talk about communication. We bring real cases, we do role play and how we interact with patients, how we can improve our communication, how can we build up a trust with our patient. And I think that's the key for uh, taking care of our patient. Next slide, please. And so that's the final uh, summary of this patient. The lesson is in center hemodialysis, not a default option. Uh, we should think PD is a default option or home hemo is a default option unless there's absolute contraindication. Next slide, please. And the last uh, case is parachute patients. And I'm sure everybody had patients like that. Uh, we have uh, this uh, 30 year old young man uh, with stage three uh, CKD a couple years ago, and then he lost follow up. Uh, and then he parachuted into our um, e or ER in the midst of uh, COVID pandemic. And cranial 15 was hyperkalemia, acidosis, nausea, vomiting, and severe anemia. Uh, renal ultrasound shows bilateral small echogenic kidney. Uh, by that time, uh, the kidney is all gone. Um, and so the next slide, please. So what are you going to do in patient like this? Do you start him with a dialysis catheter? Or you choose option B, start with a dialysis catheter? Or option C, start with a dialysis catheter? Remember, 80% of patients start dialysis with a catheter. I bet most of time he will be like that. Another option is, Let's do urgent PD start. Next slide, please. And this is an article we wrote a couple years ago about urgent PD start. You do not need to wait for two weeks for a PD catheter to put it in, then start the PD. You can start the next day after the PD catheter placement. So instead of putting the central venous catheter for hemo, you can ask your surgeon or intervention radiologist to put a PD catheter. And you can do supine, uh, low volume, and lead them gradually into this process. And vast majority of them still have some residual kidney function. You can maximize your diuretic to control the volume. Worth by worth, you could start the catheter with hemo, just do a couple treatment, get them out of the uremic state, then do PD, uh, urgent PD start. And we are very fortunate for the past 10, 15 years, we work with our surgeon, we work with our intervention radiology department. So we have two services is ready to put a PD catheter for us when we need it. So for this patient, um, the PD catheter was put in the second, no, the third day of he come to the hospital. Next slide, please. So he was started with urgent PD start and discharged from the hospital and start urgent PD start as an outpatient. The lesson is again, in center hemo with a CVC is not a default option. Always has a mindset of PD first. I think we should utilize, uh, we should talk to our patient in this pandemic, say, do you want to go to a center when 60 people stay in the same small room? Uh, you, the chance of getting COVID is much higher than you stay home. Home is the ultimate place for your dialysis. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to transition this next portion of talk to Dr. Leo Provavera. Uh, yes, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, CJ. Um, I have a few uh, more slides. 
and I'll try to go quickly over them. Uh, uh, Dr. Zhang uh, gave examples of patients uh, that um, uh, our group and he personally dealt with uh, within last year uh, during the COVID um, uh, pandemic. And I, uh, what methods or what uh, techniques and uh, pathways we utilize to maintain our program, our home uh, dialysis program, and how to we engage our uh, patients to realize the value of it uh, and they can get them at home safely. Um, as we uh, reported previously, uh, the Northern California Kaiser Permanente uh, has a very uh, robust um, uh, home dialysis program, especially uh, with the PD. We have a great success in establishing pathways, uh, uh, optimizing workflows, getting uh, those multidisciplinary care teams together uh, to support our members and our patients to uh, get the best information uh, and education about the home uh, dialysis, about the options. Uh, to make educated decision and to support them from both internally um, in uh, in our Kaiser system, integrated healthcare system, and to ensure that uh, the network of dialysis providers, uh, both contracted and internal, is providing a very um, a smooth, um, predictable transition uh, to uh, outpatient dialysis settings. Um, as you can see from uh, the, the, the slide on the right, uh, the, the COVID didn't really uh, have a major impact on uh, our growth. As, um, you know, if you, as a matter of fact, it would continue to grow maybe even uh, better uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, we went over the uh, three percentage points uh, in the incidence and a couple uh, in uh, prevalence. And then again, the, that's an attribute of how well the program set up and how quickly we're able to uh, react to dramatic changes in our landscape. Um, the things that uh, Dr. Zheng already uh, um, reflected upon, um, the quality in, uh, programs, uh, the, the peritonitis reduction, um, the, the monthly uh, work groups with um, uh, home dialysis, nurses, uh, surgeons, um, uh, and it's spreading. And it, we have 21 medical uh, hospitals and 15 medical uh, centers in Northern California. So between all of them, uh, we uh, contracted uh, with approximately 70 home dialysis clinics from various providers and have uh, three internal PD clinics. And there's a constant uh, discussion about what is works best uh, in each particular situation. Um, we have internal uh, training, uh, you know, train a trainer uh, for the surgeons, for interventional radiologists, and uh, that supports the continuous expansion of the program and making sure that uh, everybody uh, on the team uh, are consistently competent and uh, uh, able to provide highest level of uh, care for uh, patients who uh, choose home dialysis. Specifically for the COVID, I think uh, there are a couple things that um, uh, came on the forefront as a, a mitigating strategies for us. Uh, the home, um, the, the telehealth. Uh, is probably the most uh, important one. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'll show it later, uh, we were able to introduce both uh, in increased number of uh, visits, enhanced visits on the telephone, and introduced the video uh, component of uh, uh, telehealth to support patients in both uh, follow-up appointments and making sure that they're not lost for follow-up, they continue to do their uh, blood tests, uh, they, they can medications, as well as uh, introducing home, uh, the telehealth in um, uh, home-based educational activities. So uh, practically without interruption, uh, we were able to engage patients uh, in uh, as early as April, May of 2020 uh, in continued uh, CKD classes, uh, chronic kidney disease classes, uh, taking care of the kidney, which is primarily uh, diet and health and lifestyle uh, modifications and options education, again, to get patients who are on the path of uh, uh, continuous decline of kidney function to get them into most uh, optimal uh, modality selection. Um, use of uh, uh, interventional radiology, uh, especially in the beginning when uh, there was a shortage of PPE uh, and uh, the, the, the limitation of the OR access 
operating room access due to uh, aerosolizing procedures as viewed using the surgical placement of PD catheter, provided enormous support for our uh, uh, patients. Uh, interventional radiology placement of PD catheters uh, is happening um, up to, the, the, in some places, it's actually exceeding the uh, number of the surgically placed catheters with the same or even better outcomes. Uh, we uh, published on it and presented it in, the, in the, uh, previous conferences. Um, use of the pathways uh, to make sure that even in that uh, limited access, especially initially, to operate in a room um, that the patients who choose home dialysis and go in for peritoneal dialysis catheter placement have a priority. They were prioritized, again, to make sure that those patients who can uh, and able to stay home avoid additional transportation three times a week, uh, sometimes public transportation, continuous exposure, and the presence in uh, congregated settings uh, given this opportunity. So uh, interventional radiology, uh, prioritization through the surgeons, uh, and development of a partnership with our um, uh, dialysis network, with our providers, with the contracted uh, vendors, to make sure that uh, on their side uh, there's a uh, continuous uh, acceptance. Uh, the, the, the vendors have sufficient supply uh, and uh, the staffing. Uh, they have a telehealth platform to, uh, to, you know, for the reciprocity of our uh, attempts to, uh, to continue patient education uh, and to minimize uh, the, uh, the foot traffic uh, to have the uh, same platform of video tele uh, telehealth um, both in the office of the physician uh, or case manager in our nephrology department and the patient. And it was established uh, very quickly. And I have to uh, say the praise to uh, all the uh, dialysis uh, vendors uh, that we work with that uh, they demonstrated uh, extreme support, uh, both in the quickly adopting new methods of the, the you know, new realities of life and accommodating our members, as uh, Dr. Jane mentioned, with a uh, telehealth visits with uh, uh, rapidly uh, developing uh, home support for the patients who need to be uh, completing their training uh, at home uh, to, to, to send staff to their home to, the, to train them and uh, development of the uh, optimal transition you know, units and transitional care units to simplify this transition and again provide an opportunity uh, for the patients who would benefit and would be able to benefit uh, from uh, home modalities if they're given this opportunity to give them that, that transition, to give this additional education and um, uh, support in the first uh, three to four weeks uh, of dialysis initiation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so wanted to, talk a little bit about the, the telehealth uh, specifically. And uh, uh, I think uh, many of participants on this call uh, very familiar with the patient perspective. And, you know, it's a you know, patient feel uh, that uh, there's this extra mile uh, from the provider to provide, you know, to reach out directly uh, without need of patient to travel, park, go through the you know, challenges getting into medical center, potentially being exposed to other, you know, located in the hospital. So there's a lot of uh, foot traffic and there's a lot of anxiety going um, uh, in the community. Um, it provides very timely access uh, for the patient. So if something is uh, uh, needs to be sorted out quickly, um, its ability to talk uh, or even connect uh, through the video to visualize, do the you know um, abbreviated physical exam evaluation, and address the patient's needs uh, immediately uh, without need of uh, scheduling face-to-face um, -face appointments, travel, parking, and so forth. Uh, especially for the patients uh, who live in uh, remote areas uh, or without public transportation, uh, and then uh, Cutter Northern California spreads from uh, Santa Rosa to uh, Fresno, and as you can imagine, it's a there's a lot of areas, especially in the valley, where transportation and public transportation are you know limited, uh, to say the least, and you know. Frankly, it's a it's a financially financial savings. It's a you know a very good proposition for the patients. So they don't charge the copays in the major in the most uh, scenarios, um, and uh, again, uh, not removing the necessity of travel, uh, gas, parking, 
um, especially in the cities, it's a it's a big problem. Um, challenges, uh, you know, we went through this uh, over the last year. I think it's the telehealth getting better and better. Uh, compatibility of devices, availability of devices, this, those social determinant of health, you know, uh, you know, is it available, the high speed internet connection, uh, the bandwidth, how many uh, uh, people in the, in the room, you know, size of the apartments, it's so uh, really matter and, you know, plays role in, uh, you know, how well it's uh, set up. Uh, physical examination limitations are very real. Uh, you can go with uh, some and, you, you know, once you start using it more and more, getting more efficient with that, but it still doesn't uh, uh, provide this ability to put your hand on the patient and you know, to do the right diagnosis and the lightening, uh, the, the resolution uh, of the devices, uh, uh, again, and consistent and the need continuous uh, improvement. Uh, health technology literacy and health uh, health care literacy and, and technology literacy, um, you know, uh, very important. Uh, we had a dedicated uh, medical assistant or a, a program assistant to actually call and connect with the patients in advance to make sure that they um, uh, familiar with device, familiar with uh, the sequence of process on touches or, you know, clicks uh, to make sure that uh, they are able to uh, get on uh, online. And I uh, you know, we're grateful for availability of online uh, uh, interpreter services. So there's a, I, I can't even say how many languages, but practically every single one that I know of. Uh, there, there's a service of uh, uh, interpreter available to uh, add um, uh, to the call, yeah, this three-way call or video uh, to support patients uh, without uh, good command of uh, English. And of course, uh, additional benefits, which I think will be only realized uh, 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 besides right now, it's, it's only going to improve over the years with the improvements in uh, public acceptance of the telehealth uh, spread out through the uh, healthcare system uh, and improvement of devices. Um, uh, addition of uh, home monitoring uh, for the for the patients, uh, the blood pressure checks, uh, you know, the sugar uh, uh, monitoring, and uh, you know, the written monitoring. I think this is going to be over uh, with, over time uh, only uh, support and enhance uh, patient care, and help uh, better care for the patients who choose dialysis, home dialysis, home care, uh, to have this uh, two-way uh, communication about their health uh, and the support. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, this is just an uh, illustration of how quickly um, our system was able to get on board with telehealth. Uh, this is reflecting uh, just a general telehealth uh, shift um, in March, April 2020. So since March, our number of the telehealth visits, uh, you know, jumped from about 10% uh, to about 40 of total visits. So, uh, and this is counting in center hemodialysis patients who you know have to be seen face to face for various reasons. So, counting both in 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 the office, uh, that the telehealth replaced uh, in person visits uh, during the heights of pandemics uh, by about 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent. Uh, and the next slide. Uh, we were able to very quickly adopt the video first uh, strategy uh, to um, to follow this path because uh, of course the video provides additional benefits um, uh, to uh, to the patients to the clinicians uh, to the whole uh, interaction between the patient uh, and physician and making the choices uh, both in the therapy uh, and the choices in their uh, goals of care much more robust. Uh, and uh, uh, we still operating on approximately 35 to close to 40% of uh, our telehealth uh, our video. And again, it's a spread uh, from the office-based uh, video visits uh, to uh, home uh, dialysis uh, clinics. We're practically doing majority of our visits at home uh, with the home patients and the home uh, care teams through our video platform and a three-way or just a conference uh, video uh, conferencing 
for our members. And um, all of that together uh, uh, allowed us, uh, in essence, to maintain our course of growth uh, with home uh, during COVID um, um, unaltered. Um, and um, we're looking forward for the next challenges. Uh, in the next five minutes, we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, from the group. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Provera and Dr. Zhang. Um, before we get there, some questions that come in, but before we go there, I just want to share something with everybody, and I don't know if everybody on the call knows, but we started these COVID professional calls last year at early April. Dr. Zhang and Dr. Provera was one of probably our one of our early on presenters. I went back and it was almost exactly a year. It was April 29th of 2020 that both of you did a presentation and I, I went and listened to it just, you know, last week before um, I got your slides and I just wanted to kind of hear, you know, what you had to say. And um, a question came in at the end of the presentation and it, it actually segues very nicely uh, because it's about telemedicine and it's uh, the question was are you seeing more effectiveness or more engaged patients because of telemedicine and Dr. Provavero says his reply do you remember what you said a year ago <laughs> oh, I'm afraid not I, no it's no no you know it says it's hard to say in this short period of time but it provides such unique benefits Dr. Zing you also had a very enlightening quote it says, it is too early to see the results, but I bet if we come back in a year from now, you will see the wonderful modality to have the dietitian, social worker in the same video chat with the patient and provide education in the comfort of their home. So really, I hope you were a betting man and you bet on telemedicine. <laughs> because um, I would like you just to, if you could just, you know, reflect on that and share with us, really, that's, that was very insightful of you and where you've been and where you've come from. That's, um, I know some of your statistics you shared with us, but what's your thoughts now after a year later? CG, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, um, you know, this is 20, 2021, right? We use yeah. iPhone, we use FaceTime with our kids. Um, I think I let me bet again. Next <laughs> decades, we can hologram ourselves to meetings. Um, and why don't we do this to take care of our patients? Um, I think telehealth is a win, 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 win situation for everybody. It's win for the patient. Think about this. Are you telling them to take a day or half day off from their work to come to see you uh, driving across the town, go to the garage, cannot find parking spot, then finally find a parking spot, rush to your clinic, pay for a copay, and wait in the waiting room with a bunch of people there spreading COVID, and then see you. Are, are they going to ha be happy with you? No, they're not. Versus. <laughs> They're sitting in their kitchen, turn on the video, you say hi to them, and you, the time they wasted coming, and you can chat about a lot of things, their life, their family, their pets, their gra daughter's wedding, son's graduation. Who is going to like you more, the first patient or the second one? <laughs> okay, when they like you more, are they going to listen to you? I mean, back to the thing I quote, yeah. you know, in the old days, we called it compliance. Then we make it look pretty. We say adherence. We use adherence. But that still put the burden on the patient. They need to be adherent to us. We need yeah. to find a way to activate them. Okay. Uh, when I do this video visit uh, a year ago before COVID, the question to me is, what's this difference between just calling them? I look at them as like, have you do FaceTime with your kids? What's the difference between that and you just calling your kids? You know, when you see them, when you have a personal relationship with them, they would follow what you said. And you know, nowadays I do video visit uh, monthly PCC. Just a couple of days ago, I have a patient was in his bed. It was his two dogs next to him and the dogs uh, wagging their tails at me. I'm <laughs> happy to see that. And patient's happy with me. Uh, what's the best uh, for the patient, right? And other things is best for the society. 
uh, because you eliminate a lot of unnecessary visit. It's it's good for the environment. All those cars mm -hmm. in the road, all those gases uh, emitting into the right. environment. Yeah. And, and it's great for the healthcare system because we don't have to build that many garages to accommodate patients. Um, so yeah, this mm -hmm. telehealth is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Even after COVID, mm -hmm. it's not going away. Mm -hmm. And my dream is eventually we can hologram ourselves into patients' home. I've been telling this to Leo all the time. Every time I say this, he rolled his eyes. It's like, oh yeah, that's your dream. Uh, but that's the ultimate home visit. We back to our start with, you know, decades ago we go to patients' home. Uh, we will get to that point. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Provera, anything to just add to that or? Um, you know, a little bit more to reality from the holograms. I think that uh, the next uh, year will be spent really to minimization of the devices, uh, making sure that the bandwidth uh, is allowing a patient in any setting to have their phone uh, and the language. I think this is the biggest barrier right now uh, is a language uh, ability and uh, in interpreter services. Uh, it involves a lot of uh, people, professional interpreters, complexity, and I'm, you know, I, I bet if uh, we can, we, we check in a year from now uh, that the Googles of this world will come up with, uh, you know, automatic translator uh, that will enable uh, that, uh, that, 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 function uh, to, to, to speak in the native language of the patient and the provider and then that enable uh, that seamless uh, communication. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I found that and I found that very interesting that we talked about it and your, your, both your insights to what, how telemedicine would evolve and here we are. So, um, well, let me get to a couple other questions that came in and I'll kind of follow up with this one because it has to do with telehealth. What reasons do patients not want to do a telehealth visit? Um, I'll, I'll start and uh, you know, the, the, the most common one is uh, our patients constantly in transit uh, and they're not necessarily in most convenient space. So when they don't want to do the video, it's usually because of surroundings. Uh, they're either driving or the, 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 the space surrounding them uh, and they're not feeling comfortable. There are women uh, who didn't do their hair and they don't feel comfortable to appear in the front of camera. Uh, we see that the separation of video from uh, uh, telephone and uh, you know, some are specifically preferring video, some specifically preferring uh, telephone. So there's, the, I think there are going to be uh, interesting uh, sort of the evolution of the telehealth that will, um, there, it's, it's not going to be only video, only telephone. It's going to be some combination depending on the, uh, on your population, where you work, if it's a urban versus you know, county, uh, uh, country or you know, the remote spaces, that will determine how the telehealth will be utilized by both provider and patient. Uh, but providing multiple choices uh, will actually uh, uh, find this, you know, the, the best partition of the, 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 of the services. TJ? Yeah, um, my experience, the biggest obstacle is uh, technology itself. Uh, obviously, uh, the elder generations are uh, not very savvy in technology compared with younger generation. And the other thing is the connectivity. You know, you need certain uh, high-speed internet in the home uh, to able to connect. Um, you know, we are fortunately get those, uh, but the many family uh, may not have that high-speed connection. Um, but uh, I do have, you know, my oldest person who was on video visit with me, this actually started before COVID. Uh, I always a proponent for that. He is like 87 years old and uh, he's able to f connect a couple times, so not successful, finally connect. He just love it, okay? And uh, we've been going through COVID with video visit and not to, you know, he he's he's not going to come in to see me face to face, okay? And and I asked his wife to press on his uh, leg, see whether he has a demo or not. And I listened to how he talked, and I kind of feel whether he has flu in the learn or not. You know, um, I think eventually a health insurer will wise up, saying, "Let's provide 
high band, high speed internet. Let's provide devices to these people, uh, to our insurer. Uh, so they can get better care. So there will be less hospitalization, less bad outcomes. All right, thank you. Uh, another question come in, it's a couple parts, and it is, um, Dr. Zing, regarding some of your case studies. It, the first question is, what do, you, what do you send home with patients to help those with memory deficits remember the PD steps? Uh, for example, do you do a step-by-step -step poster, or are there yeah. other, other, okay. Yeah, we do step by step posters and uh, we have to. The good thing about a CSPD program is you have people go to their home and watch them doing it at home and find out the specific obstacles they might have. Um, yeah. Okay, good. And, right. and, 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 and that's the eventually telehealth will come into place is if you could have uh, put in camera in their room, uh, the nurse can watch them mm -hmm. when they do it at home. Mm -hmm. Now, privacy is going to be issue that need to be worked out in the future. But mm -hmm. let me bet again, I think uh, next couple <laughs> of years, we will be able to do that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go back and listen to this in a couple of years, we'll see. Um, so a kind of a part two to that, it says uh, case one, could he have been able to have a thigh graft or fistula to do HHD? Yeah, he could, but uh, I, you know, given that his vasculature, his stenosis and upper arm, uh, my suspicion is he probably also have some kind of very bad peripheral vascular disease in the leg too. The issue with some of the thigh graft and the fistula, uh, they could also cause in steel syndrome. Then that would be catastrophic. You might have to amputate the leg and if get that worth. Uh, we we took out the femoral catheter after he did PD. So uh, hopefully, a um, couple he can get the retransplant. I don't know. That's my hope. No. Okay, thank you. Um, with case number two, would he have been able to start PD at home sooner if there were more frequent and or smaller deliveries? Um, you you mean the case number one, he decided to do PD, but this uh, part was too small. small. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, yeah. I, you know, I always curious, how does people in Hong Kong able to do that? Uh, if you've been to Hong Kong, you see how small those apartments are, yet their prevalence is about 69% of PD because of their PD first policy. Uh, yes, uh, frequent delivery or um, um, if there's a, there's a hub in the city that uh, just like Amazon hub, you know, you can deliver daily, every day, that's even better. Um, you know, I always ahead of myself thinking of all those dreams, but I think eventually they will, that will happen, yes. Great. And the one last part to that is, um, does Kaiser provide staph-assisted dialysis for HHD and or PD patients? Uh, CJ, uh, I can, the Kaiser doesn't provide uh, home-assisted uh, programs, it's our vendors uh, that provide, so our partners in the, in the case that uh, Dr. Zheng described, uh, Satellite Health, uh, they have a uh, pilot program in our areas and uh, um, that provides staff to, good, to do home assist. And a few other vendors uh, actually do the same. And we're still on the pilot uh, site uh, internally with internal uh, peritoneal dialysis clinics to provide um, assist uh, assistance at home with the peritoneal dialysis, but it's a it's a major uh, regulatory issue uh, to provide the training and as, uh, assistance uh, in a compliant matter uh, at home uh, with a staff who is competent and uh, licensed to do that. So uh, it's not only uh, will of the organizations to provide that support. Sometimes it gets into regulatory uh, issues as well. And I think at this point, regulatory issues are much more uh, difficult to overcome than just the uh, wish and existence of the staff that is willing in, uh, to go to the patient's home to provide care. So I'm hoping for the regulatory agencies actually to uh, soften up on the, uh, their demand and the request requirements. Right, thank you. 
um, I'm not sure either either one this question could be for with the optimal transition programs are the patients running in an in-center dialysis clinic with dedicated staff to these patients or do they have an entire clinic dedicated to these patients it was in the center was dedicated staff and then the second part is what is the patient to staff ratio with this model uh I don't remember on top of my head. I have to go back to the playbook and ask the clinic. Um, well, uh, I can uh, help you partially on that. So the, the, this dedicated space, the hub or the, the bay where the uh, the patient's located, it's a four chair uh, section and there's a dedicated nurse uh, to, that, uh, to, to that bay. So there is a higher staff in ratio of course uh, and there are dedicated educators and uh, the you know, staff to provide own chair side education to the to the patients okay right um i know uh, dr provaveri has shared some statistics do you know what the uh, hht incident or prevalent rate for q4 of last year was uh <laughs> i can't come up with a um uh, from it's so hard to count. Uh, the the mm. home hemodialysis is still remains very low, and I think it still remains about two percent of total uh, uh, the, the dialysis uh, population in the Northern North in California. Um, we're counting them together uh, because I think once the patient chooses home, uh, they have tendency to stay with home. Uh, even if they start with PD, then you know, uh, hopefully transition to home hemodialysis or vice versa. So we count them as a home um, um, members uh, the, rather than specific modality. Uh, we're able to, uh, to support both uh, modalities uh, you know, uh, similarly, uh, what we kind of the, decided to take this holistic view of home care uh, as uh, the, the statistical value, so we're not separating it. Uh, I can try to count in my head <laughs> it's a percentage, uh, but it still remains rather low. I think it's still about 3% uh, of total uh, mm. population. Well, great. Well, thank you. And now we are um, just really ready to wrap up. Again, thank you both for coming, uh, taking time out for your presentation today. It was really great. It was nice to see some case studies. That, that is really quite meaningful, and I, we appreciate your time. Um, next slide, Matt. We'll just kind of wrap it up. And just a couple new tools that are out there. It's called My Plan, My Care. It's a, a tool that helps patient partner with their care team during their plan of care meeting. They have some tips, um, some suggestions and topics. They uh, are available on our website and you can find them uh, there to share. Uh, next slide. We also have uh, in-center hemodialysis and home dialysis travel resources. So again, uh, preparing for your next trip with one of these tools. Uh, telling you what to pack, how to plan uh, discussions to have with your care team if you're thinking about traveling. And uh, again, these are travel tips for in-center and home dialysis users. Again, you can find it at our ESRD ncc.org backslash patients and look for select for new dialysis patients. And then uh, under that, look for traveling on dialysis category. Next slide. And just a reminder too, the flu vaccination toolkit still posted on our website. It provides flu facts and taglines, social media content. There's a video, any, there's lots of print material and on-demand training and educational events also on there. And next slide on our kidney hub. It's our uh, kidney mobile friendly web tool created by patients for patients. There's links to all kinds of new videos, new resources are being added. There's things on COVID, home dialysis, transplant, uh, diet nutritional resources have been added. So please, uh, again, you can visit that. It is uh, www.thekidneyhub.org. Next slide. And just as a reminder of our upcoming events, our next provider focused event will be May 5th, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Our patient focused event will be next uh, Wednesday, actually the 28th uh, at 4 p.m. And uh, you can visit uh, the link there below at kidneycovidinfocenter.com to register. 
And I think that's it. We wrap it up. Thank you again, everybody, for attending today. Thank you for our speakers. We really appreciate your time and your um, conversation today. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, take care and be safe and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.